Welcome. In this video, I'm going to finish up the information from 15.1 on medicinal chemistry. Look at a little more terminology associated with uh, the world of medicine, as well as some of the dosing considerations. So because metabolism is so complex, drugs interact in many ways and produce more than one physiological effect. It also means different individuals will respond differently to the same drug, even the same dosage of the same drug. So the overall effects of any drug is classified into two groups, the therapeutic effects and the side effects. The therapeutic effects are the intended physiological effects. Side effects are the unintended phys physiological effects, and they may be positive or negative, but they were unintended. So side effects, as you might guess, vary greatly from one drug to another and from one person to another. And they may be beneficial, like aspirin protecting against heart disease, and they're usually benign or just kind of nuisance, like being drowsy, dizzy, or nauseous. But they can be severe to fatal, from organ damage to birth defects in pregnant women to fatalities or death. Patients need to be aware of possible side effects and decide if the risk or presence of the side effects is worth the benefit that she or he gets from the drug. Side effects may also mean altering your behavior to avoid them, like avoiding sunlight when you're on certain um, antibiotics in particular to prevent a rash, or taking food to avoid nausea with certain medications. A couple other terms are tolerance and addiction. When a person is given a repeated dose of a drug, tolerance can develop, which means the person has a reduced response to it. So it means an increasing dosage will be needed to achieve the desired effects, which increase the chances of a toxic side effect. In fact, this leads to um, an overdose when the effective dose exceeds the lethal dose. And scientists aren't sure if tolerance develops because the body becomes more efficient at breaking down the drug or if the cell's drug receptors become less effective. But for whatever reason, certain drugs and medications develop tolerance in the patient. A condition that's related to but different from tolerance is addiction or dependence. Dependence means the patient needs the drug to feel normal and suffers from withdrawal symptoms without it. The withdrawal symptoms can be mild like a headache from not having caffeine to serious if the drug is toxic or develops tolerance. So what is the perfect dose for each person? Well, the dosing regime refers to the specific quantity of the drug to be taken at one time and then the frequency of that dosing. And lots of variables will affect this, age, weight, gender, diet, even your environment. And then also you need to consider the bioavailability, the potential side effects, and any potential tolerance or addiction. You need to be aware of interactions with other drugs the patient is taking. So along with the previous slide and this slide, these are all things pharmacists as well as doctors need to be aware of and discussing with patients. Ideally, the dosage stays at a constant level in your bloodstream, but that's only going to happen with an IV drip. So we've developed slow-release tablets, and people usually take medications, daily medications, and multiple doses to help with maintaining this constant level. But since a constant dosage is really possible, the aim is instead is to stay in what they call the therapeutic window. And the therapeutic window is a range. Above this range, unacceptable, unacceptable side effects may occur, and below this range, there might not be enough therapeutic benefit. So a small therapeutic window means a drug needs to be closely monitored because there's a very small difference between the effective dosing and overdosing. So we calculate what's called the therapeutic index, or TI, and it's the ratio between a toxic dose and an effective dose. So bigger is better. It means there's a bigger margin of error and a bigger difference between those two doses. So several terms or measurements are used to calculate TI. There's what we call the minimum effective dose, or ED sub 50, and that's the dose that produces therapeutic effect in 50% of the population tested. A lethal dose, or LD50, is the dose that is lethal to 50% of the population. Toxic dose, TD50, is the dose that is toxic to 50% of the population. So in human studies, we calculate TI with TD over ED because lethal doses aren't deliberately explored with humans. In animal studies, however, lethal doses are explored so the therapeutic index is calculated with the lethal dose divided by the 
um, effective dose. And again, a larger TI indicate, indicates a greater margin of safety. Drug action or activity often depends on the ability of the drug to bind to a specific receptor in the body. Receptors are almost always proteins, proteins like enzymes, chemical structures on the cell membrane, or even DNA. And the binding of the drug prevents or inhibits the normal activity going on within that cell and interrupts the development of the disease. So drug receptor interactions depend on a good chemical fit between the two, and generally a better fit means better results or greater drug activity. Binding usually occurs with non-covalent bonding, so either an ionic bond or some kind of intermolecular force like hydrogen bonds, van der Waals, or hydrophobic interactions are going to need to occur for that binding to take place. In the last part of 10 or 15, one talked about research and development of new drugs, or what's often called R&D. First of all, it's lengthy and it's costly. Secondly, there will always be a need since we're always going to want more effective drugs with fewer side effects and there will always be new diseases and conditions that we'll want treatment for. So since it's costly to develop drugs, the money goes toward drugs for people in developed countries who can afford the drugs and largely toward first world problems like obesity, smoking, depression, ulcers, etc. Very little money goes toward diseases in developing countries or where there's a small market. For example, malaria is curable and preventable and prevalent in poor tropical countries with over a million people dying of malaria each year. Totally preventable. Each country has its own regulations on development, testing, and licensing of new drugs. And for each new drug that hits the market, thousands of others don't reach the market. The average time for a rug for a drug to reach a shelf is 10 to 12 years after it's first identified, and the cost can be hundreds of millions of dollars. And this chart down here just kind of shows how you go from the discovery through the development into regulation, and then finally um, the market, it hits the market, the launch of the product, and then you have to do post-marketing monitoring and follow-up. So it's a never-ending process with drug development. The approach used to be mostly trial and error, trying to mimic natural remedies without really understanding the mechanism of action. But now new drugs are developed using rational drug design where researchers find a target molecule in the body and design the drug to interact specifically with this target. The next step is to identify what they call a lead compound, um, and that's a molecule that shows the desired pharmaceutical activity. And lead compounds often come from plant extracts or microorganisms. When the lead compound is identified, researchers make and test many similar chemicals called analogs. And it's often done through combinatorial chemistry, which lets them produce and test huge numbers of molecules very quickly. And the goal is to find a way to make a similar chemical with similar results so we don't have to rely on mother nature to provide it. Animal testing is controversial so in the R&D it's tried to be kept to a minimum for both ethical and economic reasons as is human testing but there's definitely a need for both so that we know we have safety when a new drug hits the market. So human testing has three different phases or three different groups. It starts with healthy volunteers because if healthy people can't tolerate it, then probably shouldn't go any further. And then the second group are patients. And if there seems to be um, some effect, some positive effect for patients, then they do the double blind study where two groups um, are in the double blind study with some getting the drug and some not getting the drug. So they make sure it's not just a placebo effect causing the um, benefits that they saw with the patients in group two. And double blind means that neither the doctor or researcher knows and neither does the patient as to who's getting the drug and who isn't. The number of people involved in each phase of testing increases. And then as I mentioned earlier, once the drug is approved and hits the market, there's still post-marketing safety tracking or sur surveillance which keeps track of adverse side effects that may emerge over time because 
you know, with clinical trials, they aren't going to go on for years and years. So instead, it gets monitored after it hits the market. For example, thalidomide was a drug used in the 1950s with pregnant women, um, primarily in Germany and Europe, for morning sickness, and later it was discovered to cause birth defects. Vioxx was a more recent drug, which was a commonly prescribed painkiller, which was then found to um, cause heart issues, quite often fatal. So research and development is never quite fully done.